Are you ready to say goodbye to girls? No, so hard. All right, let's bring out our creative team, starting with Kathleen McCaffrey, the VP of Programming at HBO. Hang out next to me, lady. Right. We've got Jennifer Houston, casting director. <laughs> director Richard Shepard. <laughs> he plays Desi, Eben Moss Mackrack. <laughs> And the one and only Lair, John Glazer. Can you show the mic? Hello, team girls. Hi. <laughs> how are you? I know. Sad. Sad. So, how hard was it to say goodbye? I had a really hard time. I don't know about anybody else. I was fully like, like a breakup. It took me a while to kind of come to terms with it. I'm just waiting for the reunion movie. When is that I know. When, when can we book that? When's that happening? I'm ready to break the news right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's sad. It's bittersweet. I mean, I think that's the best way to put it. You know, it was, it was a great story. But they all have to end at some point, right? So. No. <laughs> <laughs> they can go on forever. I do I, feel like the end of it, even though I, my 20s ended a long time ago, I do feel like the end of it was like, okay, now my 20s are behind me. Like, I have to be an adult now. Girls is not on the air and I have to grow up. Even I felt my 20s were behind me, too. I do, too. <laughs> we'll call it women. <laughs> women. I know you all weren't responsible for the decision to end the show, but talk about that decision and how it came to be. It, you know, it was really, it came from Lena and Jenny, who uh, sort of had a vision for where they were going with the story the whole time. And then, you know, at HBO, we try always to very much defer to the creators as to when they want to end their story. And so it, it, it came from them. And, and, you know, we just, obviously, we love the show and... I would watch it forever, but, um, but they felt it was time to move on. Well, also, because Lena not only stars in the show and directs a lot of the episodes and writes a lot of the episodes and produces the show, and because of that, it wasn't just like, let's do 10 episodes and work f five months of the year. She would, we would sh they would write in, they would shoot it, and then she'd go and edit it. And so it was like an 11 month of a year job. And I think after six seasons, I think Lena and Jenny particularly had other things they wanted to have time to be able to do. Right. And I think Lena said, and Jenny said too, like, it, you know, they, Lena turned 30, she, she's out of her 20s, and that was a story about girls in their 20s, really. So. And boys. A couple and guys. Boys. They're not in their 20s. <laughs> <laughs> if I could give you some dirt. I cast all older guys. Um. Richard, I know you directed the finale. Talk about I your... I did not. <laughs> oh, you, I'm sorry, you did not direct I it. didn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jenny okay, directed it. Jenny, Jenny did. Um, talk about the experience of the finale. I mean, for you guys all watching it, I mean, what did it feel like to you to watch the finale? I mean, I know it was just a, pretty much just about, you know, um, you know, Hannah and her experience, but what did you guys think watching the finale? I don't have a microphone, so I'm borrowing one. You can share. We it's share. We're, it's, it's all, we're all close. Uh, I've, I thought it was a really good finale. It was a really cool way to finish, I thought, and not have everything like so neatly wrapped up and a really nice story to watch and very funny and interesting, and I enjoyed it very much, personally. <laughs> I haven't seen it. <laughs> you haven't seen the finale? Um, I got locked out of my parents' HBO Go account. <laughs> <laughs> if that's not Which a girl's why I'm experience, excited for I don't this, know what this is. DVD, <laughs> this, once this DVD comes out, I'm just sure to be down at my local Best Buy, you know? <laughs> I heard the DVD is going to be available soon on iTunes. <laughs> what did you all think about the finale? Do you think it's something for it was, show? I thought it was so great. I felt like finales are almost impossible because it just... People want, people Hold want a second, to, please. you got a microphone. <laughs> You're okay, all grown continue. up. Watch out. Continue. You're all grown up now. Um, and I just thought it was, you know, a really bold move. I liked seeing the beginning of another chapter in Hannah's life. And I felt like it was unexpected. And yet it sort of felt like the whole season. So I was really, 
I really loved it. I was terrified. Because my girlfriend is Jenny Connor, who is the producer and directed that episode. And I was like, oh my God, what if I hate this? <laughs> like, what's going to happen to our relationship? Did you give her any notes? She never listens to anything I said. That's why we have a perfect relationship. <laughs> Kathleen, so let's, let's, you know, now that we've talked about the finale, take me back to the beginning of the show. I know you, know you were integrally involved in the launch of the show. So what was your reaction when the script first landed on your desk? Well, it actually was a general meeting, which is it's, it's sort of my favorite thing about my job is taking these general meetings with storytellers who come in and there's nothing, there's nothing to pitch and there's, nothing, you know, there's no real agenda other than let's just get to know each other. And you know, if you've ever been in a room with Lena, you know she's completely magnetic and, and incredible. And she just sat down in my office and was sort of like talking about her life and it rolled into the show. It was completely accidental and nothing has happened in my career since then. It was like a very special stars aligning moment of like she had a story to tell, we needed something in the post Sex in the City era that didn't feel like we were copying or trying to recreate something that was so well done. Um, and so she, we start, started talking and she then wrote, wrote a one page, like this was what I think the show could be. And it originally was three, three girls. There was no Shoshana, she was, she was like a recurring. She would maybe be recurring. Maybe recurring, and then so it was three girls in their twenties in New York, and <clears throat> so then we you know, we got Jenny attached, and they have a beautiful marriage in terms of um, writing and being able to work together, and so it kind of was like a perfect thing. It doesn't go that way usually, so I feel very grateful to have been, you know, part of something that was so homegrown and organic, and also, um, God, she just has, you know. It was like the birth of the think piece. Suddenly everyone had something to say about Lena and the show, and it was like, we did not see that. When I say we did not see that coming, we did, we're like, it'll be just a little half hour comedy on HBO, blah, blah, blah. And then it was like, oh well, God. I, I thought was nobody insane. was gonna see it. I thought nobody was gonna see it too, um, either. What was your reaction when that onslaught of all those think pieces started coming? Like, holy shit, it was really crazy. And I remember actually I was in Austin, and I read Tim Goodman's review first, and he it was like a beautiful review, and I was like, well, wait, it was so weird. It's still weird to me that other people have seen it because it feels so <laughs> like us. Do you know what I mean? And we go to the premiere every year or whatever in New York and it's like on the big screen and the HBO thing comes up and I'm just like, it's so weird that every, anyone else knows what this is because it still, it always has felt small and special. So um, once everyone started loving her and hating her and all of that, it was just really intense. It was like, I had to stop reading it after a while because I would get really mad when people were well, mean to her. I would get mad because they would think that Lena is Hannah and she's not. Yeah. Like That's what it probably upset me the most. Yeah. Because um, they weren't separating the creator from the actual character. But it definitely, like in the beginning, to the, we're like Jersey Girls or whatever, and yeah. so I would feel fiercely protective of Lena, like I'd yeah. want to kill people who were saying mean yeah. things about her, and so I had to stop reading it because it was like bad for my own health. <laughs> How did you go about casting and building the world that surrounded her? No, that's me, yeah. <laughs> Like, you are the casting teacher. director. I, I'm happy to answer that question. No, okay, so what, uh, how did I go about it? Okay, so I had just quit a TV show, and I was hating TV. I had to literally fly to New York and buy pizza and beg her to do it. We were like, there's one person who can cast this show, and she was like, I'm not doing it. I, so it was before like TV became like a thing, and, and I was a, it was a Fox show, and it was horrible, and I, it, I had a fight with um, a creator, and I just quit. And I was so mad. Name, I'm like, please. I'm, what? I would actually say, ask me after. Um, so uh, the so she called literally like the day afterwards, and I'm like, I'm not doing TV anymore. You guys suck, and I want nothing to do with that industry because I had just been casting movies. That's how I learned how to cast. So she's like, Well, just meet Lena, and I knew who Lena was because I had seen Tiny Furniture. And I said, no, she seems very nice. No, I don't want to meet her. And, um, <laughs> and she goes, no, but you just sit down with her. I'm like, no. And it went on like this for like a week and a half. Yeah, and then she's just like, and I'm like, you're, you're like, fine. She can come to my office if she wants, but tell her it's not, I'm not going to do the job. And uh, she's like, great. But that's, she knew when she said the magnetic thing. She can like, she's so charming, just like, and it's genuine and authentic. And she came in and we sat down. We ended up talking for like two and a half hours. And you know, you think it's just like she like diagnosed me as an overshare, which I'd never heard that word before. And she's uh because I'm like, I talk so much. And she goes, No, you're an overshare. I'm like, how you're 23. How do you, you know? That was the crazy thing about our meeting too. We were talking about boys and like breakups, and yeah. I was like, she saw me in a way and she was so wise. And I was like, You're so much younger than I am. Yeah. How do you know? It's <laughs> as so I said, odd. I just like she's wiser than I'll ever be in my whole life. Yeah. And um, so we had a good meeting and then that you know, Cat Collins would do it. I said, okay, well, I'll just do the pilot. I don't want to be connected to. The, I don't want to do it, have a see the series and have to do it if it gets picked up. 
And, uh, and Judd approved that, because usually that's not the way it goes. But Judd said, you know, the pilot's the most important, so just let her do the pilot. So I just went about it. I said, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pretend this is like a short film. That's it, because I don't want to see it as a, as a series just yet. And, uh, and that's what I did. And, that's, and Lena hadn't ever officially cast before, because Tiny Furniture was all her friends and people she knew. And uh, so we had like our first casting sessions, and she was really a natural. She was so good with the actors. And um, wasn't Adam Driver the first person you brought in for that role? Yeah, and pretty much the only person I did. <laughs> in the, it was the first session. This and is what's annoying about Jen as a <laughs> casting director that usually you see like thirty people for a role, and she just brings in three, <laughs> and they're all good. And it's annoying. I'm sorry. Well, it's just, you know, Adam was somebody who, and I've said this before, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get him arrested. I mean, I had, for like, after he graduated Juilliard, I brought him in for every movie I did, and everybody just said, you know, he looks, he's weird looking. And, and, uh, and I was like, and I was just like, no, that's, that's my, like, my kind of beautiful, like such an interesting face. And so, um, so I brought him in, of course, for Lena right up front, because I didn't, I didn't know if she was going to like him or not. It was our first session. But for me, I was, I was, happy to bring him in for something again. And, um, and they just had real chemistry off the, just right off uh, from the star. And, uh, and I was so happy. And HBO is so great because they didn't make me see, like if it, was, if it was a regular network, they would have been like, yeah, he's good, but see another like 200 people and then we'll make our decision. And they didn't, which was the best part. Because I could hear then you really felt like you were casting like an indie movie where the director, the filmmaker's voice was being heard and there was no other parties chiming in so yeah so it was just, it's always been so we we had the same taste from the beginning which makes the job so much easier um because I can show like one person if I know it's the person that I can't find better and you know they've been Jenny and uh Lena have been great about agreeing which is really unusual that's it was, it's been very unusual from the start because we sort of nailed all of them let's talk about the boys at the end Evan how did you get cast <laughs> I, uh, it was, I guess, a sort of unconventional <clears throat> casting. Um, well, you would come in for some I, other part, right? No, I never went in. I, I, I was a fan of Tiny Furniture. No. I swear I have your audition from something else, but it's okay. <laughs> I'd known Susie for a long t a time. Um, and this woman, Marsha Debano, she used to, we, we started out working with, right? In a, like a, a great New York casting director. And when... I had heard that uh, Lena was making a show that Judd Apatow was producing, and it was in New York. It was like checking off all my boxes. I was a big fan of Tiny Furniture, and I really wanted to get in an audition for whatever, some kind of, you know, for some guy part in there. And I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't get any kind of audition and was was frustrated and then found myself at a dinner party probably a few <laughs> a few months later. My wife, who's very um, protective of me, Lena was sitting across the table from her and I think Elena and my wife started like, not yelling at her, but being like <laughs> forceful, like why, you should, you should have put Eben in your show, what are you crazy? Uh, um, and so I was like, okay, well that, that's, that's good, you know, kiss that one goodbye, that's never gonna happen. And then um, a couple of years later after the show had become the, you know, the become girls, I was out at my good friend Jesse Peretz's house in, uh, in Long Island for a, for a weekend, and, and Jesse would become one of the directors of the show, and, and Richard and Jenny were out there, and I just really hit it off with Richard and Jenny, and truth be told, <laughs> I was, uh, I, I love to cook, and I, uh, I think w one day for breakfast I was making this big kind of like, um, Spanish tortilla, which is like a big like egg and potato omelet in a huge cast iron uh, pan. And I was kind of like trying to do it. And I was talking to Jenny and I was like egg kind of covered all over. And I was making a mess of it. And I was I really like to wear tiny little bathing suits too. Um, so I just I had this sort of absurd. He was basically naked yeah. in the kitchen. <laughs> and Jenny's like, we're gonna cast him. <laughs> And then, yeah, and I was talking about the, you know, I was talking about this sort of exotic food in this, in this exotic swimsuit, and I think that was kind of the genesis of this character. But I think originally it was supposed to be like, um, you know, maybe an episode or two episodes or three episodes, and then I just kept getting invited back to the party, you know, uh, and I was always really um, uh, uh, very, you know, happily surprised. 
Well, on that note, I think we've got a clip of Desi to play. So can we roll the clip of Desi? <laughs> All right, John, you're up. Your turn. How did you land in the magical world of girls? Uh, I auditioned, and um, the part was actually different. It was just a, a dad that lived downstairs, had a couple kids, and the audition was more just trying to negotiate, you know, having the kids and keeping them off to the side while he. You had a different name, right? What What's was that? it? It was a different name, too. I think it was. Yeah. Was it? Oh, I remember asking. I feel like it started with an A or something. I don't know. It was, was it a weird. Bike? It was something like. No, yeah, it was like. Yeah, remember. It was. Uh, I'll think about it. Tell your story, though. It's like. But I think it was bike, because I remember it was, asking. It was a weird name like yeah. that, yeah. But he was like, you know, whatever, like a, like a hipster dad that sold weed, but also, you know, had to tell stories to his kids while doing it as well. And then when I got the part, um, it changed to Laird, <laughs> which I was all for. It was a really funny change. And, uh, uh, but that's the, lo that's the short version. I just auditioned and was fortunate to get it. No bathing suits. <laughs> no cooking. No cooking. Laser's been one of my favorite actors for years. But yeah, Jen yeah. has called me in on a lot of stuff. and uh, I was so happy that they chose him. Yeah, me too. It was really super, super well, it was cool. It's true. And the hat, remember the hat? Well, the hat was, uh, that was so my... So <laughs> What's that? You emailed me about it. Did I email you first? Well, the you emailed hat, me the picture of the hat. <laughs> the hat, that Laird's hat was my dad's hat. And it was when I got the, when I heard I got the part and then saw the new character description and it said he wears a beanie and I thought I had the perfect hat and thankfully they went for it but that was my that hat is older than me and uh, it was pretty cool to wear it in the show and I loved the ones they made for the kids and I got to keep one of those and yeah it was pretty cool how does this role compare to you for you to other roles that you've played it's certainly a little more dramatic which I really like I mean I've always approached it comedically first and foremost, but there were nice uh, moments to get to play more dramatically and then it always seemed to come around to some kind of enjoyably dumb moment of comedy, and I mean that as a compliment whenever I say dumb. Um, so it was, uh, I, I really enjoyed the part. It was extremely fun, certainly very well written. Uh, it was a, a, a dream scenario as far as the working environment, everybody really smart and confident and supportive and encouraging of just to be creative and inventive, even though you're working with written material. So it was a great experience that I'm very thankful for. It was really fun. And it's sad that it's over. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, let's play your clip. Oh. I remember from that scene, having my ring on, I think was an accident. I, I didn't take it off and no one noticed it, and we had already, sh I think, shot some scenes. I was like, oh shit, my ring was on, and then we just made it, I thought, a funny joke out of it, <laughs> that Laird wants the ring, and Caroline does not want the ring, and it was a pretty funny, happy accident. And that sweet hat. <laughs> Richard, I want to talk to you about your approach to directing the episodes. Obviously, you've got a relationship with Jenny, but how honest can you be with them when it comes to the scripts? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm very honest, <laughs> and I you can only you give way harder notes than we do. <laughs> but you like, can only be I'm honest like most if, scared of him. If, if if Lena and Jenny are open to discussing things, I mean, if if they didn't want to have a conversation, sometimes that happens in television or in anything. But from the very beginning, Lena was always open to discussing things. And the first two episodes I did, season one, we were sort of getting my feet wet and figuring it all out. And then in season two, the first episode I got was this script in which the girls are sitting around and they're talking about their time in camp. And it was just, it was funny, but it was like nothing. There was, no, there was literally, it, I, I was like, what is gonna happen? Like, I don't know what to do. And I said to Lena, I'm like, I'm, I feel weird, but I'm, I just don't know if there's anything here. Like, I don't know what to direct here. And she's like, yeah, I don't like this script either. And she went home and she wrote One Man's Trash in one night, in one night. And the next day she came back, she's like, what do you think about this? And I'm like, oh my God, like, <laughs> how, first of all, how did you write this in one night while shooting till like 9.30? And second of all, oh my God. And, and, and then from there, even, even from there, we worked on it and always worked on the scripts too. I felt as a man and 
a, a man of a certain age, not in his 20s, I was able to bring a point of view to, to certain of these stories that at least needed to be talked about. And so part of what I loved about directing on the show was the collaboration with Lena to the point where she started writing certain episodes for me, kind of almost expecting there to be a debate about them. <laughs> She trusted you with those, like, you know, let's call them the bottle episodes, those standalone episodes to direct. What was that relationship like? What did you bring to the table for those episodes? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, when you're doing an episode that is self-contained, like uh, uh, Panic in Central Park or American Bitch, you're, you have a beginning, middle, and end. They're tiny little episodes, thank you. And uh, they're like tiny little movies. And so you have a freedom to change the film language, like in Panic! in Central Park was all handheld. We shot in a totally different way than we normally shoot the show. In American Bitch this season, you know, we, we rehearsed on the set for a whole day without any crew around. We, we went in and figured out every single shot so that we could have the paintings made so that you can see the, the shots and the paintings on the wall. And all of this fun detail that comes from working with someone who kind of digs the same thing as you do. Like, how do we make this stand out and be interesting and yet still feel part of the show? So, you know, I, I love those bottle episodes so much, but they were always terrifying because if you fail at a bottle episode, there's nothing to cut to. You can't cut to, like, Ray at the pizza parlor. Like, <laughs> I can't find my bicycle. Like, you can't, you can't cut to it. So you're... You have to look at these things and go, we can't muck this up. And we have to ask even more questions than normal because we can't rely on being able to go anywhere else. And I, I appreciated that challenge, but particularly in American Bitch, which wasn't very funny and was pretty serious, it was a little daunting in the beginning about how do we make this, you know, captivating and not make the audience feel like they're captives. You know, it was a real interesting thing, and obviously casting goes a long way in that, and, and Matthew Reese certainly helped that situation. Um, how did you decide on Matthew Reese? Me. Well, well the, real, the real story, I, there's a million versions, <laughs> but the real story was our script supervisor was the script supervisor on The Americans, and for four years she kept going, well, the nicest man in show business is Matthew Reese. <laughs> And everyone is like, you're working, we're all in show business. <laughs> Stop, you're being rude to us. <laughs> and then when this came up, w one of the first names that sort of like popped up in the air was Matthew's name and literally she's like, he's the nicest man in show. <laughs> we're like, all right, you gotta listen. Kathleen, you mentioned how uh, Lena can be such a lightning rod. So, what's your reaction when a, you know an episode like American Bitch lands in your computer or on your desk? You know, how do you balance that need to protect her, but also let her tell the stories that she wants to tell? Oh, I'm so proud of those episodes. Those are the episodes. I, I mean, I think I've, I have. This is just whatever. My personal three favorites are the pilot and American Bitch and One Man Shots. My just my favorite ones. And it's those moments where I'm like, I'm so fucking lucky to be part of, like, be to have any to be in circles with, you know, or be orbiting these people and Lena and like brilliant directing. It's just like the, she's starting a conversation and that's what we hope for at HBO. It's like we're not driven by ratings. We're not driven by, you know, the things that we're attracted to are these lightning round things and are the real hard conversations that she is able to have in a way that you're just like, what is she doing to me? Like how, how does she know? It's, it's I mean, for, it's, they're amazing. Love it. What about for the rest of you? What are some of your favorite episodes? I love um, the Panic in Central Park. That might be like one of my favorite. When I read it, I just I loved it so much. It was just so beautifully written, and that's another one she like did in like two minutes. It's like one of her scripts that she can write so fast. She has fever. She has these fever yeah, dreams. Yeah, she did that. She writes yeah. them in one night. Yeah, that's ridiculous. what it is. Like the Patrick Wilson one, I had to cast the day after she wrote it, remember? Because we were having a table read. Well, it was two weeks before we shot it. Well, but, but we needed like, somebody at the table read. And we need someone in the show. Who was going to do the part, <laughs> right. So that so I had Jenny was like, she called me up, she's like, look, I don't have a script, this is what we need, and we need it by like, we have to give HBO a name like in, in an hour or two. So I was just kept like running by names of people who I knew were in New York, and thank God Patrick lives in New Jersey, and 
he's his friend. So I was just like, you're, you're coming out here and you're doing it. So, but he was perfect. And, uh, but no, Panic in Central Park is one of the, I think it's one of the prettiest. I mean, it's just, it's like a dream to me almost. It's, it's like, it feels like a dream. And I thought it was just so beautiful. And I thought Allison and Chris did a really fantastic job, actually. Is it a dream? Not <laughs> Panic in Central Park. Um, <laughs> My favorite episode that I didn't direct, I think, is um, uh, this past season, the, the sort of final episode with Hannah and Adam that Jesse Peretz directed. Thought was, was like spectacularly done. And I really cared about that relationship. And I loved working with Adam Driver and um, rarely feel professional jealousy, but was jealous I couldn't direct that episode. <laughs> Um, and thought they just did a, an amazing job. I think that's like of the ones that I didn't that I didn't do. Um, my my favorite, um, but you know, it's hard when you're when you're in it and you're making these things. You sort of find something to deeply love about almost everything you do. I mean, for me, without a doubt, One Man's Trash changed the trajectory of the shows I directed from that moment on for girls because suddenly Lena could see other possibilities for the show story-wise, and it opened up her way of thinking, and then she brought me along for a lot of them. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I think I agree with Jen. I mean, I really like these bottle episodes. I, I mean, also, when, I, when I'm in them, I kind of I watch in a sort of confused way, <laughs> and sort of uh, in a fight or flight, like <laughs> adrenal sort of viewing, but the... There's um, so many characters in the show that when you do get these episodes where it's just about two people, it kind of expands and breathes. And it is a much more sort of cinematic experience that I, I really like. enjoy that. And also, like, I really liked how um, formal um, American Bitch was. It just felt like a, just a, a, a very different... I, I like it within the context of the other episodes where it's frenetic and crazy Hannah's running around and this and this like all like panties are flying you know and then you get like and then all of a sudden you hit these other these these things once a season sort of and it just kind of relaxes and settles into itself and it's almost like you can process the previous episodes through watching this other one um, so th yeah those are the ones that are jumping out for me right now I think for me uh, and I'll just say one of my own <laughs> but it was it was that first one that I was in. I also just loved that episode. I thought it was a really strong episode. I mean, so many of them are, of course, but that one always pops for me. It when was, you're like stalking her in the drugstore. Yeah. That's the that's so funny. Yeah, he just like shows up. <laughs> it was just such a strong introduction to the character and uh, really really funny uh, and fun to play. But everything else in the episode was really strong as well and. That was the, the yellow mesh shirt. That was a mesh tank oh, top man, episode. That shirt was so, so good. It had a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Did you keep anything from the show? Well, just uh, the, the, the hat, which was I already had, but then I got one of the kid hats that they made. And I remember Tim Ives, the, one of the DPs, uh, sent me a photo, and it was really hilariously cute and also just cool to see it. Of course, my dad was like, oh, wow. But uh, <laughs> it was pretty. It's fun to just have that. I made my kids put them on. <laughs> Very cute. Pretty funny. What about the rest of you? Did you see anything from the set? Um, I mean, I have, I have like a wardrobe full of uh, kind of forgotten John Varvato's things. And like, <laughs> but I was, uh, uh, I think, I think uh, the forgotten Judd John said Varvato's like collection. the spinoff he wants to see is about Desi's sweaters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on set, so I can't take anything. <laughs> they didn't send you anything? No. Not we from got some good, got some good like rap gifts over yeah. the years. It was like there was a Snuggie at one point, and what else? I just got a big quilt, like a nice big wool quilt, <laughs> stuff like that. But I didn't steal it; it's given to me. Fair enough. That quilt's pretty good. Pretty that good, right? One, oh my huge. god, it's my giant, love it. super warm. HBO gives the best gifts. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was Eileen. I think, wasn't it? Hmm. Looking back over the course of the show, anything you wish had gone differently, you would have done differently. For me, it's a, it's an impossible question to answer. I mean, it's I, I look at 
the episodes I directed and I'm like, oh, well, I wish I had moved the camera this way or done something or, but these are minor little things over that, that you're nitpicking in a way to look at something, to be, for me to be able to have a front row seat of seeing Lena's creative work and working with her and seeing how her mind works and collaborating with her, like, to, it was a gift, truly. That is an HBO's best gift, you know what I mean? And so I don't, I don't, I don't know what could have been different, you know, it could have this episode or that, you know, I mean, TV shows like any creative thing take on a life of their own. I, I know that Lena and Jenny and Judd and, and you guys didn't expect that in season three, Eben's character would show up or in, you know, Laird would become a character you'd see more than once or Andrew Reynolds would become, you know, you just don't know. And because of the way they creatively work, they embraced these actors who were bringing something really original and then started creating stories for them. And, you know, you kind of amazing just to watch it. Yeah, and that's like the biggest compliment, I think, as a casting person, you know, um, when people that you're supposed to be just one-offs, you right. know, come on the show, and all of a sudden, Lena and Jenny, and you guys are like, okay, well, he's coming back, or they're she's coming back, and it's amazing, but that's that's the view, like the magic of what they do, you know, it's just, it's, it's fluid. It's a little yeah. scary, you know, like some TV shows like to have a set of rules, and this is the season, and this is the thing, and girls sometimes, you know, they did do that, they knew where they were going, but there were other times when they like saw something and went with it and, you know, I know Lena tried to, and Jenny tried to write certain, give every character sort of big, big moments as the seasons went on so they weren't forgotten about, but like, you know, it's, it's complicated, especially when you only have basically five hours a season to tell the stories. You, some people get left behind, but at the same time you can have the, these surprises where you're like, I can't believe that we're watching this episode and I would never expected Allison and Charlie to be back together on one night and, you know, and it means something. You definitely seem to have hit on some casting magic. I think Star Wars is tapping into your casting. Yeah. They are? <laughs> Who, what, Glazer, are you in Star Wars? I am, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> what was it about Adam Driver that when you first saw him made you think this is someone Oh, yeah. um, I, th I think I said before, I was just, I've loved him since he graduated Juilliard. I also loved, what I loved about him, and what I love about a lot of actors, uh, it, there are ones that come to it sort of later in life, and they've ha they've lived something before they have gone into to acting, and he was obviously in the Marines before, and, and he just had this kind of depth to him and weight that I, I hadn't seen in a really long time, and... Um, and for this, it was just, it was funny. I was, I, I normally, I read scripts, not, I don't read scripts and people jump to mind. I mean, that ha sometimes happens, but usually I try to absorb the narrative and then the story and then kind of think of my ideas. But I was like, oh, the Adam could read for that, could read for this. this was, I wasn't even expecting anybody was gonna like him. And uh, so I was, and I said to Lena, I go, I have this guy. And he's, he's named Adam too, so. Um, but he's very unexpected, you know, he, the, he, before, even before he came in, like, his headshot was a really old headshot, and it was really bad, and his head looked really small, <laughs> and his ears looked really big. And like, Jenny and Lena, and this is my first casting session with Jenny and Lena, and they're like, seriously, Jen? For, for Adam, the, the lead, and I, the lead guy? And I was like, just wait, just wait. Don't, you know, don't judge it by this picture. Um, and then he walks in, and he's like the 6'4", you know, dream, and, uh, and he's a friggin' fantastic actor. There's really no other way to say it. And uh, that's, I mean, that's what I saw. I saw amazing, and finally somebody agreed with me. And and then two years later, he's like in a gaff ad on the on a friggin' side of a building when everybody was telling me, oh, he's not good looking enough, or he's not conventionally handsome enough to be a star, and he's like modeling. Um, but he was he's the the level of acting on the show was all around just an unbelievable level of acting. Becky and Baker Thank you. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> just. Unbelievable, and and uh, what? No, I oh, don't feel uh, agreeing. No, no, I mean it was just like it, the the the. I remember directing Adam. <laughs> don't leave him hanging. Uh, directing Adam. I mean, present company. Yeah. Uh, no, don't take uh, There's nothing against you. Guys. I remember directing Adam Driver in the first episode I did on the second day of shooting, and it was in season one, and Hannah had just like shaved off her eyebrows, and she's at the door sort of like giving a statement to Adam about what she demanded. And I was like, who 
the fuck is this guy? <laughs> like, literally that feeling, like, what is happening? Like, you just looking at the monitor going, what, this is, an inc this man's incredible. Like, I didn't even, I mean, he was weird looking and it was odd and he was huge and <laughs> Hannah had no eyebrows and I, I was like, what is happening? But it was like one of those moments where you're like, oh, and, and, and every time I ever work, I mean, this, this is when you know you're in a good situation is when you walk onto a set feeling like deep excitement about the day because you're like, these actors are great. The script's already good. They're just gonna make it better. I was saying, I did an, uh, one time I was working with Eben and we got the scene after three takes and we just kept shooting because it was so fucking funny. And every take was funny and I was like, we're never using this, but I just can't stop filming this. <laughs> I just have one more question and then I'm gonna open it up to your question. So um, you mentioned when the show started it was being compared to Sex and the City. Do you think now shows are gonna be compared to girls? Like what do you think the legacy of the show is gonna be? I mean, I just, I think that, you know, girls kind of, it's a great, it was, it kind of opened doors. It was girls came first or so, it was like we were shooting it before, maybe New Girl premiere, but it was like all of a sudden it was New Girl, it was Mindy, it was like it sort of opened the door for this like wave of women doing television. And so I think that it was sort of a pioneer in that regard as female showrunner, female actor, you know, like this one girl, this hyphenate who did everything um, and was a woman. I mean, she was, there was I think one other, but there, you know, she's, she was for a long time the only female showrunner at, on HBO. And so in terms of its legacy, it's just, feel, I, you know, I feel really, uh, great about the fact that she was like part of this movement towards giving women a voice on television. Women and anyone other than white men. Women and I mean, honestly, like yeah. it just opened up this idea that, you know, there are other voices to be heard and there's a lot of talent and things that were old seem new again when it's taken from a different point of view. So, I mean, girls, I think, will have a legacy based on the quality of the work, but I, I also know that it's legacy. I mean, you can feel the difference in the way people are approaching looking for material. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's certainly not an equal playing field yet, but at least people are on the field, or whatever the term is. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely think that because Lena came out and was, you were like, who is this person who has such a voice that seems deeply fresh? And it's like, it's deeply fresh because you've never had a 20-something-year-old woman who's this talented writing, directing, starring, and producing a television show, and now you do, and guess what? It can work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, I'm turning it over to you guys. Yeah. Okay, it's tough, Robbie. First of all, this show means so much to me, so thank you for that. Um, but for Evan and John, what are your absolute favorite scenes and your characters, and why? That's, uh, oh, man. You know, it's just like a, it's just like a wash of, and I really don't like to watch the episodes too much, but just every every, I, it was such a joy. Like I was so greedy like, being on that set. Um, I never wanted to leave. I was always so happy to go, and I always felt a little bit deprived because I would only get to come in maybe once or twice every you know episode. The the t the day that Richard's talking about, where we did three takes and then we we had it, but we kept going was. It was a scene in the it's. Kitty Genovese, is that how you pronounce it? It's that site-specific theater piece that Adam's in and, and, and Jem's watching Adam. And, and I, I, we, Marnie and Desi have broken up and then, uh, <laughs> that makes me laugh so much to think about. Desi runs back, finds some, miraculously is all of a sudden finds them in this weird apartment <laughs> and runs in with this news that like they just got one of their songs maybe option for like a, a Grey's Anatomy death scene. <laughs> And like, it had been such a tragic, it had been, they'd been yelling and fighting at each other so much all the time, and it, it just got to come in with this like cranked up number 10 joy, and that just would like spill over, and she's losing it, and I'm losing my shit, and then and we're like, I have, I have a, a motorcycle helmet, <laughs> and then there's, there's uh, Hannah, who's like squirming and, and just horrified by all this, and we just, oh. We were just we just laughed so much. I mean, I, I can't like <laughs> give it just like just Evan walking in. I'm like I couldn't stop laughing. I'm like I, this is ridiculous. I've got like 12 takes of him walking in. I liked it when Desi you would cry. That was like one of my favorite things. Yeah. And uh, when you went crazy in the cabin, I thought it was like unbelievable, amazing. I mean, that episode was just so fun anyway. But you're like, you mean it was like horror movie quality. <laughs> 
Lena gave me um, at the beginning of the season like a horrible, like horrifying memoir of like um, a functioning a crack addict, a guy that she was kind of friends with, who was a journalist, who was in a, a like a very good relationship with a good job, who was at the same time was just like a horrible, horrible addict and all the secrecy. She gave me that and um, Sam Peckinpah's Straw Dogs uh, <laughs> and to, to like prepare for the thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Glazer. I think for me, that clip is certainly one of them with the, the scene where Gabby is uh, pregnant in the tub because she was literally pregnant in that tub. And uh, it was a really just logistically a fun scene to shoot and the story-wise a really fun scene to shoot uh, where you're dealing with a, an actual uh, naked pregnant woman who's also wet and slippery and I was <laughs> terrified. I really was because I'm very weak and Gabby's very tall and she's big and I was really genuinely scared because I had, you know, I didn't lift her out of the tub but there's a scene where it's, and I think we just reduced it to, uh, you know, it might have been just like action. What are we going to do? Cut. And like, <laughs> put her down gently and the stunt woman who was there to help and you know it was all coordinated with the stunt person but I was terrified uh, but it was also a really exhilarating as a scene just to shoot that and then of course giant macho Adam carried her through the streets and he is just such a giant macho man I took a photo with him just to show my son because of Star Wars and then when I'm showing my son I'm like god his head I just looked so teeny and his head is so huge he's a monster uh, but that was a real highlight um, yeah go ahead Well, thank you. Um, uh, Rock solid question. Wow. Yeah. Really good. The check is in the mail. Uh, um, you know, people have talked about how they are related, but for me it's interesting because for One Man's Trash, it was the first time Hannah had, a, to me, a sort of positive sexual experience where she was not being humiliated. And a lot of what I thought about of that episode was just that. Was like, and we did it in a one, it's one take, and Lena's such a brilliant actress, she like blushes in it. It's, it's an extraordinary piece of work. But I, I was always approaching it from an emotional context about really what she was going through, and, and also what Patrick Wilson was going through, but certainly what she was going through in that episode. American Bitch struck me because there was really not an emotional component, it was a logic, component and so it was they were to me quite different except that you can look at them and go yes there is some sort of connectivity it's, a, it's an older man there is some a lot of sexual politics involved both of them live in beautiful places and you know the casting of locations is as important and vital as for a director as the casting of actors and for me it was like I have to find a house that not only fits the script but fits the character, so when the actors walk into the set, they feel like that it makes sense. It's like the wardrobe needs to make sense. If you're doing a scene in a restaurant, the actors, the extras playing the waiters, and what they're being served has to make sense. Because if anything doesn't make sense, actors will find a problem and they'll lose the focus of what they're trying to do. If you can bring them in and you can, in a very artificial setting, make it feel as real as possible. So in terms of like the Matthew Reese episode, it was just, ex you know, once I saw that room with all the books in it, I started seeing what that entire episode was gonna feel like cinematically, weirdly. Did that answer your question or did I just ramble? All right, who knows, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was good. It's a disaster. Right in the back. Uh, 
I mean, it's right away. I mean, she, she just starts talking, and you're like, how, like we were saying, like, how do you see me? And she's so self-aware and articulate, and um, and you're you just like, you're like, not only is she a brilliant artist, but she has something to say, and she's incredibly intelligent and really sparks interesting conversation. And so for us, like I said, it was it stars. It was really a unique situation because kind of right away we were like, oh, she's saying something, and I mean, she's 23, but like, <laughs> all right, you know, like it doesn't matter. She's got something to say. So, um, I mean, and it's, I was in my 20s then too, so like spoke. You know what I mean? It was personal for me also. I was like, how does she know my life? And like, <laughs> I have an Adam. Like, you know, like that was really resonated with me personally as an executive. So it was easy to fight for it because I was like, oh, somebody gets me finally. So. But what's interesting, I want to say a story. I went to the editing room of the pilot, and Lena showed me a much longer version, actually, than, than the, the pilot ended up being. And I remember leaving and thinking it was unbelievable. And I said to Jenny Connor, I said, I think the show should be called Girl, not Girls. Because I was like, she's such, she's such an individual that it's, it's about her. And Jenny was like, no, it's Girls, because mm -hmm. it's... She, she doesn't represent everyone, but she does. It, it was such a, a I, I honestly, if I had power, I would have called a girl and it would have sucked, you know? I mean, it was like, <laughs> and that Lena and Jenny could really see what that is, that, that there would be some connectivity, even if they seemed d different than the people you knew. There was something about it that was humane and human to a lot of people. And I think that's important actually to point out is that, so we didn't expect Lena to represent all girls, right? But it was, you know, when we program for HBO, you program towards a niche audience, right? So it's more of like, we want to, you know, no, Game of Thrones is for everybody fine, like everybody watches it, <laughs> yes. But like our other program, we're like, okay, does it meet this generation? Does it meet this population? Does it meet, you know, this sort of segment of, of society or whatever? And she just, you know, not everybody spent their 20s in New York or whatever. And, had it, but she was enough, there was enough that resonated that we were like, it'll speak to somebody, and as long as it's somebody's favorite show, then, then it works. But the expectation, and she got a lot of flack for that, I'm the voice of a generation thing, but like, the expectation was not for her to represent everybody, it was just for her to represent those people who came, you know, the small audience that we wanted her to meet. So she got, I mean, I think she is sort of, whatever, but she would, she would say that, the Han like Hannah said it when she was high, she didn't mean it, you know what I mean? So, um, but she kind of was. So. Actually, um, I brought Dan, I did for Danielle and Uzo in for for Lena before Orange even came out. Yeah, because we were doing because Orange and Girls sort of cast at the same time once we started it. Um, and uh, yeah, I brought several people before the show even came out. That um, I mean, Lena knew about the show, and I told her, and she's fantastic or whatever. So um, you know, I, I bring in my favorite actors for everything I do. You know, even if they're not what the description says. Like, I don't care. Uh, yes. I, it's the only way I can, I, it's just, I, if I can picture somebody doing it, it's a different way than it's described. I want to give my show, my show runner or director um, a lot of different choices. So um, in terms of crossover, if you see like a day player on both shows, it's just because I've loved them and known them for 20 years. And, and, think, and I mean, Lena and Genji make the decision of who to hire, but they don't, uh, obviously there's no, Connection between the two of them, except for me. So, yeah, yeah, no. But the Danielle thing was it, Orange hadn't even come out yet, and she, I brought her into because I didn't because Orange was like a web series as far as I knew. I didn't think anybody was going. to, I mean, I knew nobody was going to watch, the, you know, the show, and because uh, it was like a weird title, and I was still getting DVDs from Netflix, and like House of Cards hadn't even aired yet. <laughs> so I was like, it's no harm if I bring in like Uzo and Dan Danny into audition because they're not going to see that show anyway so I actually didn't expect anybody to notice anything so um, so I guess I hope that answers your question yeah they're totally separate it's just actually the reason I got Orange is because Genji is a fan of girls and that's how she got in touch with me and how I got that job so you know that that was like a wonderful gift you know that, that girls has always done for me you know so so that's a connection Lena and Genji both have really good taste What's next for each of you? I mean, obviously, Kathleen, you're still at HBO. What are you working on now? Um, something, something kind of different. I, I'm working. I'm working on the new David Simon show, The Deuce, which is 
about hookers in New York in the 70s. And yeah. I was like, I, how do I go from this like hugely okay. feminist piece? But he is, he did a beautiful job making it very okay. feminist. And it's Maggie Gyllenhaal and Michelle McLaren directed the pilot. And so um, that premieres September 10th. <laughs> 10th. So that's the can, can I direct on the second season? <laughs> yes, you can. I think so. we'll write a bottle episode for you. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Orange is still going. And we're still going to be going for a couple more years. And I'll only do two shows at a time. So now that Girls is done, um, Glad Glow came along too. So that's a new show for Netflix that'll be airing. Um, but I, but I also I'm doing a, a show for uh, Warner Brothers and Hulu. It's the Stephen King show Castle Rock, um, which I'm so excited about because I'm a big you know horror genre kind of person. And uh, and then I do movies throughout the year too. I'm doing a couple movies, but just always working. So. Um, the next thing I'm doing is going to the bar and having a shot of tequila. <laughs> uh, I just finished the first season of um, The Punisher, Marvel uh, Punisher for Netflix, which is my second favorite network. After HBO. <laughs> I wrote a pilot, it's called Girl. <laughs> but, uh, what we did was we, we put a question mark at the end. So it's the name of the show is Girl. And then I'm making a second season of this show that I made for True TV called John Glazer Loves Gear. And it's, uh, check it out. <laughs> well, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody here. And thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you, guys. Yeah.